Welcome to today's launch webcast for the Relay Rocket. This will be flight two of the series, and before we get into things, let's talk a little bit about the stream. Similar to previous launches, today's stream is delayed about five hours from the actual time of launch. If you're watching this now, the launch has already happened. 
This happens because I don't have the crew or equipment to do an effective webcast on site. Moving on, you'll see that the relay rocket is right behind me, and if you pay close attention, you'll actually notice some changes from last time. One of the more obvious visual changes is that we don't have parachutes anymore. There are no parachutes on this rocket at all. The mass budget on this rocket is very tight. There's very little room for extra things to be on board, which is why we're also not carrying extra cameras too. There's one camera right around here, if you can see it, and it's much lower quality than previous onboard cameras we've used. To start off, let's talk about what happened at the last launch. Relay F1, or Flight 1, had a few issues during its flight. If we break them down into two primary issues, the first was a thrust vectoring issue. If you look back at the footage, you'll see that the rocket actually tips over about two-thirds through the flight. The second issue was that literally nothing deployed. Uh, the rocket took a pretty hard landing coming down from 120 feet with no parachutes, no legs, and no way to really break the fall other than some mud on the ground. Going back to the first issue, the TVC issue, or thrust vectoring issue, was caused by a small wire that was jammed in the mount. I've actually run into this issue before. Echo TV4 failed for the same reason. It's a little embarrassing that this happened a second time, so I've modified the standard operating procedure to make sure this cannot happen again. Moving on to the second anomaly of Relay Flight 1, was that nothing deployed. The issue is a little complicated for me to describe in full depth right now, but it comes down to a software bug. Essentially, I had two conflicting pieces of code in the software. One was writing that it was time to deploy, and the other was writing that it was not time to deploy. Luckily, the computer was responsive even through the bug. I was able to look through the data and find out what actually happened. Moving on to today's flight, during today's test, Relay will be looking at all the onboard sensors through the flight to decide if it is safe to retropropulsively land. Let's quickly talk about what's supposed to happen during today's flight, and then we'll head over to the launch pad. Relay should ascend to about 150 feet above ground level. For reference, Relay Flight 1, the last launch, ascended to about 120 feet, so it'll just be a little bit higher this time. Right around Apogee, two things will start happening. The computer will switch its processing speed to prioritize certain sensors over others. It's very important that we get really fast altitude readings on the way down. We need these readings so we can light the second motor at the best point possible. Another thing that will occur around Apogee is the drag fins will pop out. I've claimed that the drag fins will pop out on two different flights now, and they haven't. I'll be crossing my fingers during today's flight to hope that it actually does. In an effort to also maximize the pressure shift that the drag fins induce, I've installed an ultralight webbing in between each fin. This means that instead of four individual fins, the surface area causing drag will more than double at the top of the rocket, ideally making it very stable on the way down. If Relay decides that it's safe to land, it'll light the second motor, ejecting the first one out. The second motor will continue to burn as the rocket lands softly on the ground. At this point, I'll mention again that all of this is experimental. I have high hopes for today's flight, but it is unlikely that the rocket will land standing up. As with every flight, there's a lot of new hardware and software flying on this. There are a number of chances for failure, and though I've done my best to try to minimize those chances, they may happen. As always, I'll be looking forward to see the data from today's flight, and I'll talk to you after the launch. We'll drop in at around T minus two minutes at the launch pad. From the VPS SOP, T minus two minutes on my mark. Three, two, one, mark. On to page two, arming GSE.
T minus 20 on my mark. Let's get into the results of today's flight. I won't be able to talk too long because I got a little backed up in my editing process for the webcast today. That said, today's flight is a big step forward in some ways and a big eye-opener in some other ways. One of the steps forward is in the thrust vectoring slash stabilization area. The rocket had a beautiful ascent correcting for any deviation it had on the way up. You'll note that it also didn't curve over like the last flight did because there was no mechanical failure. I fixed that. The system still needs a little bit of tuning, but we're getting very close and it's getting better every time. One of the more surprising parts of today's flight was the drag fins and their apparent lack of performance. After opening around Apogee, like that, these drag fins were supposed to stabilize the vehicle on the way down, keep it upright. This kind of happened, but the rocket mostly behaved like a pendulum instead of a straight stick falling down. These drag fins are obviously not going to work. They either need a massive modification or a total replacement. The good news is I've been thinking about why these didn't work and I already have some ideas as to what we can do to improve them or replace them completely with a better system. As one more quick side note, I just remembered this. The part at the end where the rocket spits out tons of fire on the ground, that's an error with an electromechanical relay on board. I'd made provisions to keep the landing soft for the relay. I kept it mechanically isolated from the rest of the body, but I didn't do a good enough job. The reason I bring it up is that it can be seen as dangerous or irresponsible to have a rocket fire like this on the ground uncontrolled. Just yesterday, I found the fix for this issue online, and parts are in the mail so that this issue can no longer happen again. If you're interested in learning more about the project, you can visit www.bps.space, or you can follow me, at Joe Barnard, on Twitter. Thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed the webcast, and I'll see you at the next launch.